Your young viewers need to look at me, 71 years of age. Think Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security, the off-balance sheet liabilities of the U.S. government. Net present value exceeds $120 trillion. Add those two numbers together, it's $150 trillion, not including state and local problems. That debt is solved by a, prop, by a budget that is itself in deficit $2 trillion a year. For young people like you to understand the ills of the American economy, you just need to understand that the total amount of private assets, which will be passed on from my generation to your generation, is $150 trillion. And we've already spent it. In a thought-provoking analysis, Rick Rule sheds light on the dire financial predicament facing the U.S. economy. With off-balance sheet liabilities exceeding $120 trillion and total debt surpassing $150 trillion, the nation stands at a critical juncture. This staggering debt burden, compounded by annual deficits of $2 trillion, poses a significant threat to future generations. As Rick Rule emphasizes, the consequences of irresponsible fiscal policies are already manifesting, with young Americans facing the grim reality of inheriting a debt-ridden economy. The repercussions of this crisis extend far beyond national borders, impacting global financial stability. It's imperative to heed these warnings and take proactive steps to safeguard our financial future. Don't forget to like, share, subscribe, and turn on post notifications for more insights into navigating today's economic landscape. You need to be con concerned with the absolute deterioration of your purchasing power, not the relative decline of the purchasing power. Uh, during my duration uh, at Sprott, I remember very well uh, talking to some uh, Asian sovereign wealth investors about gold and various products. And I remember asking them once, saying, you know, as an American, it's lovely that we paint a bunch of promises on pieces of paper called treasury bills and we send them to you. And you send us stuff like cars and steel and computers. Seems like a good trade to me. Uh, how do you think of these as an investor? Because I sort of think of them as time bombs or, or long-term lies. And I remember my host looking at me and smiling and says, Rick, what you say is very true, but yours is a liquid, transparent lie. Uh, and although we don't trust each other, we trust you more than we trust each other. And I think Americans need to understand that. The difficulty that Americans have to face isn't the foreigner's perception of us. It's the reality that we're creating for ourselves. Uh, the on-balance sheet liabilities of the U.S. government exceed $34 trillion. That's the banks. But the off-balance sheet liabilities are worth. Your, your young viewers need to look at me, 71 years of age. Think Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security. The off-balance sheet liabilities of the U.S. government Net present value exceeds $120 trillion. Add those two numbers together, it's $150 trillion, not including state and local problems. That debt is solved by a, prop, by a budget that is itself in deficit $2 trillion a year. For young people like you to understand the ills of the American economy, you just need to understand that the total amount of private assets, which will be passed on from my generation to your generation, is $150 trillion. And we've already spent it. The net present value of the obligations that we're passing on to you is also $150 trillion. We voted all, all kinds of cool stuff for ourselves, and we forgot to pay for it, and you get the bill. So your job is to figure out how to save yourself from our profligacy. When people understand that, when people come to understand that the problem isn't China, the problem isn't Russia, the problem isn't Iran, the problem isn't in the euro, the problem in the United States is the United States, then you'll be most of the way there in terms of engineering the architecture of the way you survive and thrive for the next 30 years. What I mean by that is that uh, almost certainly the U.S. Treasuries will be redeemed by the U.S. Treasury, and they'll be redeemed at par. The problem is that the spending power of what you get paid back in is going to be much less 
than the spending power that you spent to buy it. I fully expect the U.S. government to be able to sell all of these because confidence in the U.S. dollar remains strong and the alternatives for most people and most countries are non-existent. The difficulty is not so much what happens over the next two years, but rather what happens over the next 10. Let me explain this to you. Most of your viewers and most thinkers, most congressmen, view inflation through the lens of the CPI, the Consumer Price Index. Those people believe that inflation is diminishing your purchasing power by about 2.7% compounded. I would suggest to you that the CPI isn't a cost of living index. I would argue that it's a manufactured index. In the first instance, it's hedonistically adjusted. They determine by some formula known to them the true economic value of the apartment you rent and the computer you buy, which is divorced from the price you paid. In addition, when it's inconvenient, it doesn't include food or fuel, which is useful to you only if you don't drive or eat. But most importantly, the CPI doesn't include tax, the single most important expense that most people face. I tried to backtest my own consumption of goods and services, and I learned to the best of my ability to calculate it that the purchasing power of my savings is declining at about 7% compounded. So the problem for the, for the bondholders comes like this. If you buy a U.S. 10-year treasury and they pay you 4% a year, they're paying that to you in a currency where the purchasing power is declining by 7% a year. In other words, the U.S. government is basically guaranteeing to cost you 3% of your purchasing power a year every year for 10 years, a promise that I believe they will pay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they will keep. And what happens isn't so much in the near years. Right. You don't notice that 3% deterioration in the near term, in the near years. But years five, six, seven, never mind 17, you notice it in a major way. Uh, and I think that's what happens to the perception of value offered up by the U.S. dollar and to alternatives, uh, in my case, often gold. The decade of the 70s was fairly tumultuous, and we could talk about that later if you like, uh, in terms of past being prologue. But beginning uh, really with the end of 1981, the Volcker years, when, when interest rates very, went very high and inflation and the perception of inflation was conquered, the period 1982 to 2022 was probably the most benign economic period in the history of humankind, particularly if you're an American. The American dollar was in the ascendancy. Uh, we had the ability to, us, to use seniorage. In other words, we printed currency and sold them to other countries. They financed our idiocy. Uh, and our idiocy was profligate. Yeah. But with the dollar strong, interest rates declining, housing strong, employment for those who are employable strong, uh, nobody noticed. Uh, buy the dips was the mantra. The bond market went crazy because the prime interest rate fell, fell from 17 and a half to four, <laughs> making existing bonds more valuable. All that changed in 2022. The interest rate bottomed and started back up. Uh, you went from credit easing to the beginnings of credit contract contraction. When uh, bond yields go up, the cost of capital goes up. The yields that are paid to savers on savings instrument goes up, and that makes existing dividend streams less valuable compared to savings, which hurts equity prices. So we've come into a period where the wind isn't in our sails. And I think increasingly, too, we come into a period where the wind, at least in certain cir circumstances, is in, in our face yeah. rather than in our sails. I myself lived through a period similar to this in the 1970s. The writing was on the wall for inflation beginning in 1968. You won't remember, but your father might. We fought the war in Vietnam uh, and we fought the war on poverty. By the way, we lost both. Uh, and the consequence of that is that we had a bunch of debts that we couldn't afford to repay. We had a choice between reneging, that is to say, ending Social Security uh, and defaulting on our foreign bonds, or inflating away the net present value of the obligation. In the decade of the 70s, we chose the latter. Specifically, yeah. the purchasing power of the U.S. dollar in the period 1970 to 1980 declined by 80%. <laughs> um, and my 
the suspicion is that what faces us over the next 10 years is something similar. Yeah. I believe myself that it's going to be less extreme because I believe that there are other economies in the world that will begin to do well. And the ascendancy of those economies will make uh, America's sins less apparent. But I don't think you'll get through them well if you don't pay attention and start acting on your own behalf now. Thanks for tuning in to today's insightful discussion with Rick Rule. We've uncovered crucial insights into the daunting financial challenges facing the U.S. economy, from off-balance sheet liabilities to the erosion of purchasing power. It's clear that the burden of unsustainable debt falls squarely on future generations. As Rick emphasizes, understanding the true nature of these challenges is essential for navigating the economic landscape ahead. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel, like this video, and share your thoughts in the comments below.